So we need to start with a definition for nutrition. And it's really the process by which organisms do two things. They obtain energy to help maintain life functions. So things like they absorb glucose, and that is respired to make ATP that drives enzyme reactions and protein synthesis. And nutrition also means the taking in of molecules to allow matter to be created and maintained. So things like amino acids are needed to be able to build proteins that create cells, that create structures. Now, we know there's two uh, forms of nutrition. One is called an autotroph and one is called a heterotroph. So autotrophs include two types of organisms. Organisms like the plants that can photosynthesize. So photosynthesize. And organisms like some bacteria that can chemosynthesize. So we know photosynthesis is where light energy is converted to chemical energy in the form of glucose. And we know chemosynthesis is where the energy released from inorganic reactions is used to build more complex organic molecules such as glucose. So these two processes build complex organic molecules. And these organisms therefore essentially make their own food. Now heterotrophs are actually quite different because these cannot make complex organic molecules. So they have to consume them. So these consume complex organic molecules as part of their diet, as part of their nutrition. And these include organisms like all fungi, such as yeast cells, which are unicellular fungi. They have to take in glucose from their environment. All animals we know are heterotrophs. They cannot photosynthesize. They cannot chemosynthesize. We know animals include things like um, the insects, which are arthropods, uh, fish, mammals, which are chordata, and also earthworms, which are annelids. So they also cannot make their own complex organic molecules. They have to take them in as part of their diet. Now, we know there's four main types of heterotroph. Uh, the saprophytes include all fungi and also some bacteria that cannot photosynthesize. So bacteria can also be uh, heterotrophs as well. Now, these secrete enzymes outside the cell, and these enzymes digest complex molecules outside the cell. So we call it extracellular digestion. And the products of this uh, digestion are then absorbed into the cells across the cell membrane of these organisms. So they secrete enzymes, they digest their food outside the organism, and the breakdown products are then absorbed into the cells and utilized now, holozoic feeders have to ingest complex organic molecules and they then digest them in a very specialized internal, so a specialized internal digestive system. So we know our digestive system as holozoic feeders uh, includes the esophagus, the stomach, the small intestine and the large intestine. Now, parasitism is um, another type of or mode of nutrition, if you like, whereby the organism lives within or on the surface of, so we could say on the surface of, a host organism. And the parasite always uh, obtains nourishment from the host at the expense of the health of the host. So they always cause harm to the host and occasionally even death to the host. So a nice example of this would be uh, wasp larvae. So a female wasp will inject her fertilized eggs inside a caterpillar, which is actually the larval stage of a butterfly. And these fertilized eggs develop inside the caterpillar into larvae. And the larvae feed off the tissues of the uh, caterpillar. They do not touch the delicate internal organs of the caterpillar. Uh, they feed off the non-essential tissues. And that causes essentially, ultimately, harm and death to the um the caterpillar, which is the host organism. Now, mutualism is slightly different, and we'll see this uh, very shortly. Uh, this is where we've got two types of organism that have a beneficial relationship. So things like ruminants, so ruminants like the cow or the sheep, they have one part of their stomach called the rumen. So it's the first chamber of the stomach. It's a four-chambered stomach. 
and that contains cellulase, so cellulase secreting bacteria. And these help to digest cellulose and they allow organic acids to be produced that get absorbed by the cow and used for energy. Now, the cow offers these uh, cellulase secreting bacteria a protective environment in which to replicate and, and grow. So it's mutualistic. Now, if we start with the human digestive system, uh, we know it's basically a big long tube and there are certain specialized structures um, along the length of this uh, digestive tube, otherwise known as the alimentary canal. So we're going to see that there are four main uh, parts to human digestion. The first one is called ingestion. So ingestion. And that's because we're holozoic feeders. We have to take in complex organic molecules, ready-made organic molecules through the mouth into the buccal cavity. We've then got digestion. And we know digestion starts in the mouth because salivary amylase is secreted. We know digestion also occurs in the stomach because proteins start to get broken down in the stomach by endopeptidases. 90% uh, of digestion in our digestive system occurs in the small intestine where proteins are completely broken down to amino acids. Um, carbohydrates are completely broken down into their individual monomers. And we know triglycerides are broken down into fatty acids and glycerol. So the third job of the digestive system after digestion has occurred inside the ileum, the small intestine, is absorption. So absorption of these breakdown products of digestion. So we then absorb amino acids into our bloodstream across the small intestine called the ileum. We absorb fatty acids and glycerol. We absorb amino acids, sugars, mineral lines, etc. Now the fourth process is called egestion. So that is where we actually egest as feces anything we can't actually break down through digestion. So we do not make or secrete cellulases, so we cannot break down cellulose in plant material. We also do not have mutualistic bacteria such as the cow or even rabbits do. So because we don't have mutualistic bacteria, um, these bacteria, because they're not present, there's no cellulase enzymes, so the cellulose we can't break down and it becomes part of the egested fiber material. Now, Fiber, even though we can't digest it and absorb the breakdown products, is very important because it does stimulate peristalsis. So the smooth muscle wall called the muscularis, we know that can contract and relax. There's the circular muscle and the longitudinal muscle. That's really important to allow the bolus of food to go in a single direction through the alimentary canal. So we know at the top here, we've got the buccal cavity. We know salivary amylase. So salivary amylase is part of saliva, as well as a bit of mucus and alkaline, alkaline solution. So we know in the mouth, the breakdown of starch is initiated, as well as some mechanical digestion here. And we know starch is made of amylose and amylopectin. So we get some mechanical breakdown, as well as some chemical enzymatic breakdown of starch. Now we know the food that we eat, the bolus of food goes down the esophagus and it ends up in the stomach. So we know the esophagus is a muscular tube and we know peristalsis is the method by which, so we can say here peristalsis, the bolus of food goes down into the stomach. Now if you drink liquid, that gets down into the stomach within seconds, about six or seven seconds. Um, sometimes food takes a little bit longer than that to get down into the stomach, but it's still fairly rapid. Now, this structure here at the end of the esophagus is called the sphincter. So that is called here the cardiac, we'll see in a minute, the cardiac sphincter. And it's basically a... Um, a valve made of muscle and it allows the food that comes down the esophagus into the stomach so the stomach is really a muscular bag so this bit here 
And in the stomach, we find hydrochloric acid. So the pH is about one to two. So it's very acidic, very low pH. And we find pepsin. Now, pepsin is an enzyme that works optimally at this very low acidic pH. So we could say optimum pH. Now, pepsin is what we know as an endopeptidase. So endopeptidases break down big long proteins or polypeptide chains into shorter peptide fragments. So at this point, amino acids aren't released, but shorter peptide fragments are released because to break down proteins, it's a, a stepwise process whereby the protein is first broken down into smaller fragments and then the amino acids get cleaved off the end of the shorter fragments in the uh, ileum further down. Now we know in this muscular sac um, is hydrochloric acid and the main job really of the hydrochloric acid is to kill off, so kill off potential pathogens from our food. So most pathogens will not be able to survive in the very low pH of the stomach acid. So things like fungi and certain strains of bacteria will be killed in the very acidic gastric juice which is secreted from the stomach wall. Now, there's another muscular um, sphincter or valve, if you like, called the pyloric. So this time the pyloric uh, sphincter, sphincter, pyloric sphincter. Now, that is, if you look here, around about this position. And that is a muscular valve that allows the bolus of food from the stomach down into the duodenum. So if I just highlight this bit here, so this is now the small intestine that extends outwards from the stomach and the duodenum is the first 20 centimeters of the small intestine. And hopefully you might be able to see here, not only does the bile duct enter the duodenum, so if I just highlight the duodenum is this bit here, also the pancreatic duct enters the duodenum. So we get bile from the gallbladder that was originally made by the liver. It moves down the bile duct into, so that's the bile duct, into the duodenum. Pancreatic juice made from the pancreas, this structure in yellow, moves down into the duodenum as well. Pancreatic juice contains many different enzymes to help in the digestion of carbohydrates and proteins and lipids. And that starts in the duodenum. Now, the wall of the duodenum has specialized glands called Brunner's glands. And those Brunner's glands secrete an alkaline mucus, which has two jobs. It neutralizes the acidic bolus of food from the stomach. And it also provides a protective layer of the epithelial cells of the duodenum. So these cells are not digested by the uh, digestive enzymes released into it from the pancreas. So we know the pancreas is what we call an endocrine gland. So it does secrete hormones, but it also, things like insulin, it also makes digestive enzymes. So in the pancreas, we've got pancreatic, pancreatic juice. Now that contains pancreatic amylase to help break down the starch, the amylose and amylopectin. It contains an enzyme called trypsinogen, which is another endo, peptidase so it breaks down larger proteins or polypeptide chains into small short shorter fragments now trypsinogen is an inactive form of um, endopeptidase so there's another enzyme made from the pancreas called enterokinase and what this enzyme does it actually cleaves off a portion of trypsinogen to activate it releasing the active trypsin and that's the endopeptidase that's going to continue the breakdown of proteins. Now, after the duodenum, the remainder, so I'll do it in green, the remainder of the small intestine, this big long tube, about 20 foot in length, this is called the ileum. So this is where 90% of the food that you eat gets broken down and then absorbed into the bloodstream. So 90% of the 
of the food that you eat here, 90%, is actually broken down, digested in the ileum, which is the main part of the small intestine. So we get loads of digestion here. So things like um, short polypeptide fragments are broken down into dipeptides. Dipeptides are broken down into amino acids, which are both absorbed. We know starch is broken down to maltose. Maltose is broken down to alpha glucose. These are both absorbed again into the blood. We know triglycerides are broken down into fatty acids and glycerol. And again, these are absorbed not into the blood, but into the lacteal, which is a lymphatic capillary. So it's not just digestion, it's also absorption. So the ileum has two roles to play, digestion and absorption of uh, soluble molecules or ions that we can then use um, when they're distributed around the body. Now, anything that is not digest digested or absorbed, things like cellulose, for example, they pass into this bigger structure called the colon. Now, the colon has a certain structure that goes up called the ascending colon. It then transcends across the body, so this big tube in red, and then you've got the descending colon. Yeah. So this red tube, this big thick red tube, is called the colon. So the food this time goes down here, the descending part of the colon, and any undigested food gets stored in the rectum and then it gets egested, egested from the body as feces. Now there is an important part role to play of the colon. Now we know it contains bacteria, these good bacteria involved in um, secreting certain chemicals. So some of the bacteria can absorb uh, molecules within the bolus of food. They then synthesize quite often very important vitamins like vitamin K, vitamin K1 and K2. And we then absorb these vitamins that are made from the bacteria across the wall of the colon and into the bloodstream. Now, we also know lots of water does get absorbed at the, um, at the colon into the bloodstream. Now, water can also be absorbed in the ileum uh, as well as the colon itself. So we know a lot of food contains uh, water and we absorb this through the wall of the colon. Now, if we look at the digestive system of rabbit, it kind of looks very similar to what we've just seen in the human. So it has an esophagus and it has a muscular sac at the end of the esophagus called the stomach. Now inside the stomach is hydrochloric acid and also pepsin, which we know is an endopeptidase. So breakdown of uh, protein starts in the stomach, the hydrolysis of uh, protein to shorter polypeptide fragments. You can see here after the stomach is this big long tube called the small intestine. So this big windy tube here is the ileum. And that has the same role as the human ileum. So we know it's going to digest 90% of the food that's taken in by the rabbit. Things like proteins get digested here, triglycerides get digested here, and also the breakdown products get absorbed in the ileum, much like in the human. But we know there's the, the diet of the rabbit is very different from humans because it's largely vegetation based. So grasses and things like this. Now we know there's lots of cellulose from plant material. So these rabbits have what we call mutualistic bacteria that secrete cellulase enzymes. But these bacteria are actually found in the first part of the large intestine, um, this bit here that extends outwards called the cecum. So this is an extension of the large intestine at the end of the small intestine. And inside the cecum are mutualistic bacteria that secrete cellulase enzymes. Now, these cellulase enzymes break down the uh, straight polysaccharide chains. So straight chains of uh, polysaccharide made of beta glucose that collectively form uh, hydrogen crosslinks to form microfibrils to release beta glucose. And that beta glucose 
ends up as part of the fecal pellet. So what's left of this digestion gets passed down the rest of the large intestine as a fecal pellet, a small round pellet, and it gets egested out of the rabbit. So the fecal pellets that get egested out will actually have a lot of glucose in them. So they're going to be quite sweet tasting. Now, the rabbit hasn't been able to uh, absorb the glucose here because the digestion of the uh, cellulose occurred after the small intestine, which is where absorption would normally take place. So what the rabbit does, it um, eats the fecal pellets. Now, it's only going to eat the fecal pellets that have a sweet taste because it knows they contain glucose from the digestion of cellulose. And this is called reflection. Eating of the sweet fecal pellets. Now, when these sweet fecal pellets get taken in through ingestion, we know they pass down the esophagus into the stomach. We know it, the bolus of food passes down the ileum. And this time, the glucose that was in the fecal pellet can be absorbed across the ileum wall into the bloodstream. So the fecal pellets that get eaten this time, the glucose can get absorbed into the bloodstream of the rabbit. And any more fiber, anything that can't be digested, passes straight through. So the fecal pellets that end up being ingest, sorry, egested the second time are the harder fecal pellets. And these lack any glucose because it's been absorbed in the small intestine as um, the material passed through the rabbit a second time. So these would be hard fecal pellets. And these would have had the uh, glucose removed because it's been absorbed as um, the matter passed through the digestive system of the rabbit. Now, what you could do is, um, if you're doing an experiment to look at the hard and the soft fecal pellets, now we know the soft fecal pellets contain glucose, beta glucose. So we could say beta glucose. So you could do a Benedict's test. Now, when you do a Benedict's test, we know that's the test for a reducing sugar. You have to always heat the solution with the Benedict's reagent in a boiling water bath. So a boiling water bath. And what you can see here is a gradation of color. So if there's very little reducing sugars, it might be a sort of greeny, yellowy color. And the more reducing sugars are present, we're going to have an orangey color going to brick. If there's lots of reducing sugar, brick red. So the Benedict's reagent is actually, we know it's a blue color to start with. And if there's lots of reducing sugar, we're going to get a dark brick red color. Now, if there's only a little tiny bit of reducing sugar, such as the hard fecal pellets, that might produce a greeny color, indicating a very small amount of reducing sugar, if any. Now, the cow is a ruminant, so this is slightly different to the rabbit. And the stomach is much more complex, if you like, and it's got four chambers. So what the cow does, it eats it, the grass or the vegetation. So this this line in green will kind of follow this up. Now, this gets passed up the esophagus by peristalsis. So we can put peristalsis. And it goes into the first chamber, which is called the rumen. So number one here is the rumen. And this big structure here is a big chamber. Inside this are mutualistic bacteria that secrete cellulase enzymes. So this is the first chamber of the four-chambered stomach in the cow. So here we've got cellulase enzymes being secreted from, from uh, mutualistic bacteria. And what these do is they take the straight chains of cellulose and they break or hydrolyze the glycosidic bond to release the beta-glucose. Now these bacteria actually absorb the beta-glucose and they use some of it in respiration, but they also convert some of the glucose to what we call organic acids. And these get secreted from the bacteria into the rumen. Now, organic acids can be absorbed across the wall of the rumen into the blood of the cow. So this is how the cow gains energy from the rumen, 
by the absorption of organic acids that are released from the uh, mutualistic bacteria. Now, what's left is called CUD, and that gets passed into chamber number two called the reticulum. So it's actually this little chamber here. I'll just show this bit here. Okay, so this is the reticulum. Now here are also some cellulase secreting bacteria. So there's further digestion of any cellulose, and there's also a bit of mechanical breakdown of the cud as well. Now from this point, if we look at the red arrow, the cud gets passed back up the esophagus, back up the esophagus towards the mouth for further chewing of the food. So we know the teeth, the molars and the premolars at the back of the jaw of the cow, they're going to have that characteristic W to M arrangement for grinding vegetation. We know it's a, um, a horizontal movement of the jaw. That means side to side. We know that makes these ridges sharper over time. And we know the cow is a herbivore. It has unrestricted roots to allow continuous growth of the teeth because they get ground down over time. So we get a bit more mechanical. So we could say here mechanical digestion occurring in the mouth. And the cud then gets re-swallowed back down the esophagus. But this time it doesn't go into the rumen, chamber number one. <clears throat> it goes into uh, chamber number three. And that's called the uh, amasum. So chamber number three. So if that's number one, the rumen, we know the reticulum is number two. Chamber number three is the amasum. This one here. Now, this is where water is absorbed from the grass material in the third chamber. So the water from the plant vegetation gets absorbed into the blood of the cow. Here, so this is going to be water. And what's left of the cud gets passed into the fourth chamber, which is actually called the abomasum. So this would be chamber number four. Now, the abomasum is very similar to the human stomach, and we know it contains hydrochloric acid and endopeptidases. So here, protein starts to get digested very much like the human stomach. So this is really, the, the abomasum is called the true stomach of the cow, because this is where the protein starts to get broken down. Now, within the cud in the abomasum, the true stomach, there will also be some of these cellulase secreting bacteria that are brought along with the plant material. So we know because of the, the very low pH, the acidic conditions, the kind of gastric juice, that's going to kill a lot of these bacteria. And um, everything gets taken into the ileum, the small intestine, from the abomasum. So all this plant material is then taken into the small intestine. Here we get further digestion, so further digestion of food. And we also, more importantly, get, just as we would do in the human small intestine, absorption of the breakdown products of digestion into the blood. So this is the ileum. So we could say here ileum, the small intestine. So we know the... Uh, the stomach of the cow has four chambers. The first three chambers are the rumen, the reticulum, and the omasum. And they're actually a modified lower esophagus. The fourth chamber, the abomasum, is actually the true stomach that contains endopeptidases like pepsin and hydrochloric acid. And that's where the protein starts to get down. That's where any pathogens will be killed as well.